Good day, everyone. Welcome to our triumphant entry theological roundtable. I am Gordon Rankin, the conference minister serving the New Hampshire Conference of the United Church of Christ. This is the first in our series of theological roundtables being produced by the New Hampshire Conference. These roundtables will be sent out via our conference weekly news and posted on our conference Facebook page on each day, Palm Sunday through Easter. They will also be available to you on the New Hampshire Conference website, as well as on the New Hampshire Conference YouTube channel. The intent of these roundtables is to provide a little extra content and inspiration for those in our churches during this time when it is bound to be a rather unusual Holy Week experience. So with this understanding, I want to begin by uh, turning to those on our roundtable pan panel, just to confirm with the panel that uh, they are willing to allow their voice and wisdom to be shared among our churches in this way I've described. Is that okay with you all? Yes. Certainly. Yes. Very good. So now that I've asked this question, it seems like it would be a good moment for me to introduce our panel for this triumphant entry uh, roundtable. First, we have the Reverend Dr. Martin Copenhaver, a retired president of Andover Newton Theological School. Thank you, Gordon. We have the Reverend Celeste McQuarrie, intentional interim pastor at the Center Harbor Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. Trying to be there, here I am. There she <laughs> is. Celeste is having the type of bandwidth connection issues that we're all having during this time. And we will welcome her when we can see her or just listen to her voice. Thanks. We have Tracy May uh, Calvitus, our pastor at our United Church of Christ churches in Dublin and in Harrisville. Thank you. And we have the Reverend Rob Grable, our, the associate pastor of the Church of Christ at Dartmouth College, located in Hanover. Joy to be here. Very good. Thank you all for being with us and participating. Um, I am excited to hear your wisdom that you will share today. As we turn to consider the Palm Sunday triumphant entry into Jerusalem story, I'm going to begin us with the scripture, or one of the scriptures in this case that we associate with this story. Uh, today, taking from Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 40. When he had come near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, just say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. Then they brought it to Jesus. After throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. So before we dive into consideration of our scripture, I want us to think a moment about traditions. At least in the churches that I have served in my career, there have been some rich traditions on Palm Sunday. So I want to inquire of you, what has been a meaningful church tradition to you? And how has that colored your understanding of the Palm Sunday event? I'll jump in. At uh, our church uh, for a number of years, uh, one of the great 
Palm Sunday traditions is taking the palms and turning them into crosses using a uh, very delicate folding technique. And as is usually the case, the children become the experts first. Um, and there's never a loss of older members of the congregation who want to learn. So right away, you've got this wonderful generational activity. And many times I see and hear stories of these crosses remaining in a prominent place uh, all throughout the year. And, and that leads us to our second uh, tradition is that we take the palms from Palm Sunday and the following year we do burn them and make ashes for Ash Wednesday out of them. And that's a, a great teaching aid for acquainting everyone with the whole cycle of the liturgical calendar. Very good, thank you. Well, we, um, uh, I, when I was a pastor, um, we would often start outside and process in a kind of parade ourselves uh, and and uh, following the children, but all everyone involved, it took a, a while for the adults to be willing to actually wave a palm. I know for New Englanders, it seems like too much. I don't know, but, but eventually people really uh, would, would get into it. And, uh, and, and, and we would parade around the sanctuary uh, uh, a couple of times to get that sense of, of uh, holy procession. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is that, that we really um, asked people to see that as the, the, the gate of entry to Holy Week mm -hmm. and, and to really encourage folks to uh, uh, take part in all of the worship opportunities. And we added uh, uh, rather, um, a, a second uh, Good Friday service so that more people could participate as well as Monday, Thursday, and then, uh, and then an Easter vigil. And uh, in advance of Palm Sunday or on Palm Sunday, I would very much encourage folks to uh, to 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 uh, experience the whole cycle. And I would say that you know, if I if I were a doctor or I'm writing a prescription for uh, spiritual growth, um, th this is what I would this would be very near the top of my list of what I would prescribe is to enter into that Holy Week cycle uh, in, in an immersive way and and. I had the gratifying experience of a lot of people taking me up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the doorway into Holy Week. I yeah. like looking at that sort of Jesus paves the path by his steps on the donkey, mm -hmm. the colt. Mm -hmm. um, I like that image. Um, and I have, was surprised this week to learn that for some in my congregation, that triumphal entry was really all that they knew about Palm Sunday. Couldn't, and it's our tradition to read the whole um, story of the Passion as well. Mm. And so for me, it was more about we're stepping into the Passion story and found that I had to do a little teaching on that, that it, it wasn't just the triumphal entry or the victory parade, if you will. Right. In the, I mean, yeah. if people go just if they, people come to worship on Palm Sunday, and mm -hmm. then and then they come back on Easter, you've got these two uh, uh, kind of celebrations and to miss the whole cycle and the whole experience. I think that's what you're saying, Celeste. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. But I, I find it helpful to be able to revisit that every year because even as adults who have done this year after year, we get we forget what it's yeah. all about. Yeah, I often wish I had a whole month to really cover the events between the entry and all the way through Easter. Um, it seems like too short of a time to try to fit things in. Yeah. I was also remembering as a child growing up in the church, this, uh, it seemed so special to receive a palm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it yeah. was the only time of the entire year that that I went to church and actually came away with something tangible as, as a child. And, and that's made quite the impression. It's very, very tactile and also like a party favor. <laughs> yes. And this year I had decided, well, there's no need to order palm fronds. You know, we're not going to gather um, in person. And then after some time went by, I thought, no, I need to order some and I'll just put them in a vase on the front steps yeah. because that's, some people might amazing. really need that symbol especially now that's excellent
are doing that as well. So a tradition yeah. I started, as you know, I am interim, so I've only been doing this for a few years with this congregation, but I brought them out into, out of their pews, and they each took a part in the reading of the story mm -hmm. of the Passion to uh, help them engage in it being their story. And they all had a part. So they weren't watching actors on a stage or anything like that. It was, it is their story. They owned it. And I have been, I have been really blessed by that. So I, I will toss in one of the traditions that uh, I, uh, over time, came to find as quite dear. Uh, in a church that I serve, the anthem, the Palms, was actually uh, sung congregationally as the opening hymn for Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it was sung at a more rapid pace than I have ever experienced anyone else singing it. Uh, we, we had three music directors while I was there, and all of them learned that it had to be played at that pace. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me probably five years just to figure out how to get all the words into the meter of the song. We, we would go through it so quickly. And I wondered for those years, I'm like, what is it about this experience that this congregation finds so meaningful? Mm -hmm. uh, and after a while, I, I began to see that it was such a time of um, community and joy and celebration and for that congregation that was like the one moment in the year they were willing to let loose and <laughs> wave their palms insanely and scream and shout Hosanna and uh, they could kind of release all of that during that one song yeah. and it better enabled us then um, to be community together when we got mm -hmm. to Monday Thursday and Good Friday yeah Lovely. And I began to really appreciate that moment. And, and so something that I, I started off by wondering, okay, why does this work for this community? <laughs> um, I, I guess I realized I had to learn about why it was going to work for me, which was finding the joy that they share. Uh, mm. But it became quite meaningful to me. And, mm. and now I only want to sing that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's take a deeper look into our scripture that we read earlier. Uh, in all three synoptic gospels, the Palm Sunday story starts with uh, this little prologue of the disciples being sent to retrieve the colt, and uh, if somebody inquires about it, saying the Lord has need of it, and then they go, and exactly as it was explained, somebody says, why this colt? And they say, the Lord has need of it. What meaning do you find in this little prologue to the story um, that kind of sets up the rest of what happens for the Palm Sunday? I think one of the things that strikes me is, is putting myself in the, uh, in the sandals of the disciples and thinking, wow, Jesus really is as good as he says he is. Because uh, it all played out uh, whether we snuck ahead and made a, made a deal with the owner of the cult or not, that it really validates uh, that Jesus is uh, out of the ordinary. And then at the same time, I understand that term Lord was often used, was the term that the Romans were referred to as they were the Lord. And so I find that this is where the irony begins, because Jesus can say, just tell them the Lord needs it. And so, of course, they're going to get they're going to get the cult and they're not understanding the irony. But with, yes, of it being a cult and that's the humility that Jesus brings in. And at the same time, he's using what they're resisting in order to get what he needs. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's something that spoke to me. And the Lord who needs something from us. I mean, that in itself mm. is, is uh, mm. a part of the irony. I mean, there are lots of ironies here. I, I, mm. I noticed uh, for the first time in reading this, um, you know, how something can be hidden in plain sight. You didn't, didn't uh, to you, you read and say, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was there, but the, the, the cult that has never been written. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Is that like um, 
um, coming in a new car? I mean, is it like a, the new cult smell that <laughs> where Jesus or is it, you know what what is uh, what, uh, what is the significance of of that? I uh, but the fact that the the Lord needs it and that I might be able to provide it. Um, it's it's a little bit like taking our part in the in the in the drama, Celeste, as you were speaking mm -hmm. of doing in your worshiping community. Right, right. Martin, there's uh, an interesting uh, foreshadowing there with the cult who had never been written because at the end of the week, he's placed in a tomb that had never been used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Ooh. Yeah. I, I had also wondered uh, as I was looking at this week if it was a connection with um, ritual sacrifice. Um, and often you would be offering a, a unblemished sacrifice and here Jesus is riding in on the unblemished animal for the time of sacrifice. Yeah. yeah, and at the end of the day, he won't be riding anything, but will be being ridden mm. yeah. by a cross. Mm. I feel like the, the beginning kind of, from a storyteller perspective, mm pulls me right into the story. It's like, okay, Jesus is telling them this is what's going to happen. And that does come to pass. And it just, it serves to pull me right into that instant, you know, right into that time period. And I want to say, I'm tempted to say that it, assurance knows exactly what's going to come to pass. And I have spent a lot of my life feeling that way, that Jesus, okay, this is his way of saying, I got this, just trust me. And yet, <laughs> I have to admit that uh, just earlier today, I realized, well, is that, am I seeing it that way because that helps me feel better? Mm. And I have to say, I think, it is because when I think that, so Jesus, he did have this first part of the story figured out, but then there comes a time when he actually arrives in Jerusalem and then what? Mm -hmm. And I have to say that is unsettling for me personally mm -hmm. to think, well, maybe he didn't fully know, like this preamble kind of sets us up to think, don't worry. Mm -hmm. So it seems like also a little false sense of security right there. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can say, as I've been preparing ahead for some of our upcoming round tables in this week, um, there are lots of our Holy Week stories that begin with this, this is what's going to happen, and then you watch it unfold. Yeah. Uh, that, that seems to happen several times as we uh, explore the end of the passion story. The old, the old trick of uh, tell the person with the upper room that the master needs it uh, works very nicely for, uh, for the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. I'll be discussing that one again in a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking earlier about the irony in this story and absolutely clearly the Palm Sunday story is filled with this great sense of dramatic irony. Uh, cloaks and branches are being laid before Jesus, the signs of a royal welcome, and yet Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, the sign of humility. What does this juxtaposition tell you about who Jesus is and what does it say about our journey of faith? Well, the uh, the, the the Jesus that they're, they're, uh, the crowd is cheering is that they they thought they knew who they were cheering, but they really didn't. I mean, that's another irony. They they were looking for a different kind of leader, expecting a kind of triumphant en en entry. Um, that 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 he's not going to. Um, upend the, the oppressive Roman occupying forces. He's not going to end the people's suffering. He is going to suffer with them and in some way transform the suffering of the people in doing so. But th that's not what the folks wanted. That's not what they were looking for. And, uh, uh, and at that, so there's, there's an irony there that they're cheering 
uh, they think they know who they're cheering for, yeah. mm-hmm. but, they, but, but they but they they don't yet, and it'll it'll become clear in the course of the the story of the next week. Um, but uh, and and also the, the the great irony that the people who are cheering are likely the same ones who are calling for his crucifixion, and the fickleness mm-hmm. of the people uh, as well. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and and we certainly see that in in, in our own uh, time in in many disturbing uh, ways. Yeah. Is yeah. it an invitation? Is it an invitation for us to try to have that same humility? Can those um, holy items, the things that are being laid on the ground? for um to adore this leader if you will can they be symbols of holy ground and what what does that call us to do i like your question gordon because you ask specifically how does this impact your own journey of faith and i find myself asking the question do do i have the courage to take off my shoes and walk on holy ground with Jesus. Yeah, about my own journey of faith. I mean, I feel like I, I like, I'm not alone in this. I'm sure that I'm uh, often looking for God in all the wrong places. <laughs> you know, have my own expectations, and and not not only um, uh, God, I expect you to show up, but here's exactly how I want you to show up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and often God uh, will um, come come in the back door. And uh, I can sometimes miss it entirely, of course, but, uh, uh, excuse me, it says my battery's running low. <laughs> my, the expectations came up for me also, Martin. Um, I, I can just feel the expectation in the people making the way for Jesus there. And I am also aware that of course, they're not going to get what they expected. And I think the people that were hoping to silence Jesus, obviously, they're not going to get what they expected either. So there's a lot of uh, high expectations. And yet we kind of know that um, many people will be disappointed, right, yeah. later on. Yeah. yeah. We, we know what's going to happen. And Jesus knows what's going to happen. But the multitudes, the Pharisees, this is really like a peak of a wave that's about to crest. It is a triumphal entry. And it's so full of poignance and irony because one verse later, Jesus weeps. Uh, mm-hmm. He knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, um, the best Palm Sunday sermon I ever read, um, um, and I, I can't tell you, I don't remember who it was. It was a long time ago, but it made an impression on me. It was uh, uh, written from the uh, point of view of the of the donkey. <laughs> and how the donkey, uh, in bringing Jesus in, thought th- thought in some way that the crowds were cheering for him. <laughs> and, and the ways that, uh, that, that, that we build ourselves up in contrast to the way uh, Jesus is... Uh, um, uh, um, the, the the spirit of downward mobility, as it were, and and, and humility. Uh, anyway, that image st- stuck with me, and I draw on it still. And I, I try not to be that uh, uh, that ass um, <laughs> <laughs> that thinks the story is about me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a thought as we've been talking, I, I think there's. Um, this other ironic piece in how Palm Sunday sets up the rest of the Holy Week stories, um, it, it occurs to me that many of the major points of the Holy Week stories are in group gatherings. Um, you have the crowds for Palm Sunday, you have the gathered disciples for the, the Last Supper, foot washing stories, you have the crowds again at the trial and the crucifixion. And then ironic, the big moment at the end mm. at Easter, it's just a couple of individual souls visiting mm. grave site to prepare a body for burial. Mm. Um, so the big crowd things happen earlier. And, and um, 
I find myself wondering, um, does this have faith meaning for us in this year um, when we will gather together as Christian community uh, during Holy Week, but in a different way than we've really gathered together in other years in our experience? And what new signs of holiness will we find in that? Yeah, mm -hmm. good question. There's a lot of hand-wringing about the fact that the churches are going to be empty on Easter, but since we're commemorating an empty tomb, uh, it's incredibly appropriate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, uh, 40 days of Eastertide to, uh, to sort it out. Mm -hmm. and not to get point, Rob. Well, not to get too far ahead on the, on the calendar, but uh, if things work out as they might, and as we prayerfully hope, uh, there's all the possibility of, of quite a celebration on Pentecost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is another receiving of the Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gordon, I, I wanted to touch back on the part of your question that, that um, you asked about faith and what, what does this, does this in some way, um, this juxtaposition of how Jesus enters Jerusalem and how that might have to do with um, our own personal faith. And to me, what, what came from that is that things were not as they appeared as he entered Jerusalem. And so much in a Christian walk might also not appear, things are not as they appear on the surface. Um, especially with worldly eyes, you know, and, and what a beautiful thing that is. Um, so I just find my, I found myself really wanting to celebrate that, um, even though it's also unsettling if you think about it, right? Oh, if mm -hmm. you're so used to, oh yeah, I see how that is, but that's not how it was. And, and in our own lives, and especially with this current pandemic, we just don't know. Um, and there's, there's a lot of room for miracles, I think, when we just admit that we don't know and things might not be as they appear. And, and may I go back to what, what Rob was saying about Pentecost? I mean, I, I, I really uh, uh, think that's wonderful. And I think there's an opportunity for us to celebrate Pentecost, perhaps, uh, as, as, as we have never done before. And I think about, and even if we're still in this kind of state, uh, the spirit came when the, when the people were, were closed in a room. I mean, that uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the spirit uh, descended um, and, and circulated among the people as they were isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm hopefully we will not be in a, a physical sense um, this year, but if we are, I, th I think that story will take on uh, a special meaning for us. I agree. So one of the reasons I chose the Lucan version of the Palm story is that I love the little piece at the end mm -hmm. where uh, the Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to quiet the disciples. And Jesus says, if these were to be quiet, even the stones would shout out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to shout out about what is triumphant in our Palm Sunday moments, it's harder to shout out in some of the everyday moments. Mm. Uh, what do you find that are ways in which today's disciples have grown silent? And what are the things that the stones are shouting out today that we need to be adding our voices to? I was drawn to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I was drawn to Mary Oliver's poem, Thirst. Mm. And it struck me in this few lines. I think she's a disciple or was a disciple. God rest her. But uh, if you're familiar with that poem, and one of the things I think she is addressing with it is our privilege, the sense of privilege we all have. And um, maybe are not completely reconciled to. But if I could just quote a little bit of that, she says, 
I give thanks, but it does not seem like adequate thanks. It doesn't seem festive enough or constant enough, nor does the name of the Lord or the words of thanksgiving come into it often enough. Everywhere I go, I am treated like royalty, which I am not. I thirst and am given water. Beautiful. I just thought that was so perfect to this story. Mm. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. I mean, of course, what, 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 what do we need to do as disciples and what should we, should we be shouting out about? And I said, where do I begin? Right. I mean, there are, there's so many things. And I, I just, uh, the hope that in, in this time that, that we seize that and, uh, and not uh, shrink from, uh, being the, the, the church of witness and uh, for that, that second or third rather great awakening as, as you're anticipating, uh, it, it will require us to have a public voice uh, in a time where uh, th those voices are not always appreciated. And, uh, and, and so we need to be that much clearer, that much stronger and for our voices to be heard. I, I know I, lo I love what's over Rob's uh, right shoulder there. We rise, we resist, we repent. I think that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder if that's the right order of things. That's what I've been wondering about. <laughs> is, it, is it repent, resist, and rise? I don't know. Maybe. Uh... Uh, we, we might get to have a whole nother round table on that question. <laughs> You know, I've often, I've loved this, this ending for uh, this story as well. It's actually a favorite. And I wondered about that image of the stones crying out. If, do we actually see that as the stones literally crying, almost like in some kind of a graphic novel, we can put faces on them and make them shouting out. My interpretation of the stones crying out is that Jesus is trying to repress a riot. That those stones, if the, if, if the people are told to be silent, they will pick up those stones and throw them. And that they will be a source of a riot. That's how they will cry out. And oh that Jesus is taking this on himself. Because the people don't know why this triumphal entry. They really don't know. Some of them, I think some of the research I did showed that uh, many of the folks who were spectators didn't even know who Jesus was. And I think and Martin so, is correct so. that, that in less than a week, these are the same people who will be yeah. crying for Barabbas. Yeah, but that passion that's in there, that at, given the times, I wouldn't have been at least at all surprised if those, those would be stones that got thrown mm. in a riot. I'll tell you one thing that it, it just occurred to me that um, uh, Tracy, going back to your saying is you wish you had a month rather than a week <laughs> to move between Palm Sunday and Easter. And I certainly relate to that. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that in this time, um, a week seems like a month. I mean, uh, so much seems to be happening and, 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 and kind of the ups and downs. And, and uh, I, I can relate to the, uh, uh, the packed dr drama of a single week uh, mm -hmm. these days more than I, I would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. Gordon, I'm awfully glad that you chose the account from Luke because despite the fact that there are no palms right. <laughs> and despite the fact that there are no hosannas, uh, <laughs> this is such a true uh, triumphal entry. And even though this particular uh, section is plucked a little bit out of a very rich context, uh, it does such a good job to orient us toward what's going to happen next, because you have all the triumph. You know, this is not the first triumphant procession into Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. that opens up all those comparisons with the royalty who have paraded in. You know, I'm sure both Herod and, and, and Pilate had their triumphal entries at some point uh, mm -hmm. leading up to the Passover, uh, Passover week. But, but this Luke uh, and, and the, the psalm that goes with it, that's quoted in Luke, uh, just, just fits so well together.
Mm -hmm. I'm going to use that comment, Rob, to, to um, lean towards our final question with one another. And that is, um, Palm Sunday tells this triumphant entry story, and we know where this will lead. Uh, and our understanding of the story is Jesus knows to some extent where this will lead. But probably most of those people crying out didn't have any idea where this would lead. Mm -hmm. um, so the question I want to end with is knowing what follows in this story that we would like to take longer than a week, perhaps a whole month to, to share and talk about, knowing where this story goes, does that add to the Palm Sunday story for you? Does it subtract from the Palm Sunday story for you? How does knowing what the rest of is going to happen in Holy Week help you understand this Palm Sunday story? I think for me on both ends, I, I try to spend some time with, okay, how do I approach this knowing the ending? It's harder for me to approach it as if I don't know the ending. That's what happened this morning. I thought, well, what if he doesn't, what if he didn't really know the full scope and how everything was going to work out? Um, which, which also then brings up that, wow, what, what faith and trust, you know, to, to enter into that Eastern gate and to enter in on a cult and to allow the people to lay down their cloaks and branches instead of saying, no, 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 I mean, radical faith and trust there. Um, so I just want to lift up both, both ends of the spectrum that it's a completely different view to know or to not know. And I feel like we take it for granted that, um, that because we think we know, that can be like putting on blinders, right? So I have to always remind myself, enter into it as if I don't know the ending. And usually then I find those little gems that I skimmed over before for like decades, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, uh, Tracy May. I, I, um, I think it's important to stay in the right part of the story. So where, where are we in the story now? And uh, as much as possible. Um, and I, I, we, we can't unknow the ending, but, uh, but I think we can situate ourselves at a certain point in the story in, in ways that allows us to experience the whole um, drama of the week. And that's what I would uh, um, strive to do is to stay at that that point in the story uh, because it's it's of a piece. And uh, I mean, if I, I remember um, someone who taught me preaching um, s said that um, every sermon is a little bit heretical. And and what what he meant by that is not that you say. Uh, false things or heretical things, but that you don't tell the whole story. So you have a sermon that's on on uh, judgment, and and uh, and you don't necessarily have to include grace, uh, but it's heresy not to include grace. Uh, and uh, or you can focus on the Holy Spirit for a sermon and not mention other members of the Trinity. That's heresy, but you do that for that. So in in and by an analogy, I'm saying that for this story to be in that. Uh, it's the whole story that's, uh, that, that um, is a saving story. It's not any one aspect of it. It's the whole story. But you can only uh, enter into one part of that story fully at a time, or at least uh, as much as one is able. I find myself wondering this year, uh, you know, we as pastors, we have our routines and, you know, you're preparing to to talk and teach the Palm Sunday story with your congregation. And yet you, you have life going along at the same time. And often I find, yeah, well, at that point, I'm, you know, arranging for a family Easter meal and who's going to come over and who's going to bring what and um, making sure that there are eggs for all the kids to die and, and all of those people all of those pieces. So my 
church spiritual life focuses on Palm Sunday, but my regular life focus tends to be a bit ahead of that. Mm. I'm find myself wondering this year with um, us not having some of those same connections, will I be mindful of Palm Sunday and uh, the Last Supper and uh, the trial and the crucifixion in a new way because I'm just more present to that in the moment. Yeah, yeah there's always, a, as a pastor, you're, you're preparing your um, Easter bulletin on Palm, or, you know, right after Palm Sunday, you're, you, you do have to uh, to anticipate where the, where the story is going. So I, I like that, Gordon. Maybe there is a way in which uh, able to uh, stay with this, the, the sequence of the story better in this circumstance. Well, this vehicle has for me, and I hope for us, and I hope for everyone who's uh, logging on and watching it. This has been very rich. I think I will use that to thank all our friends who are watching our roundtable today. I most definitely want to thank Rob and Tracy May and Martin and Celeste for your insights, your wisdom, all that you have shared today. Thank you so much for being with us um, and helping to um, provide inspiration to our churches in this season. Thank you for convening us. You're very, very welcome. Our next round table will happen tomorrow. And at that, we will focus on the story of Jesus turning over the tables at the temple. Everyone have a very blessed Holy Week. Yeah. <laughs>